Good evening. Uh, welcome. My name is Gwen Barley. Sorry, I'm still adjusting the mic a bit here. And I'm the Vice President of Community Partnerships and Grants at the Colorado Trust. Welcome to our first Health Equity Learning Series for 2019. We're so thrilled to have you all here tonight uh, and can't wait to um, share this evening with you. So as you know, or as you might not know, at the Colorado Trust, our vision is that all Coloradans should have a fair and equal opportunity to live a healthy and productive life, regardless of race, ethnicity, income, or where we live. In other words, our work really aims to address health disparities and inequities. Yet for far too long, few disparities and inequities rival those seen among indigen, I'm sorry, indigenous populations in Colorado and nationwide. I want to briefly share some facts and figures that, with, that, will, um, that will help to illuminate um, what our presenter is going to share tonight. More than 56,000 people living in Colorado identified themselves as American Indian or Alaska Native in the 2010 census. More than 46,000 of them live in the Denver metro area. Across the country, life expectancy among American Indians and Alaska Natives is five and a half years less than all races in the country. And when you look specifically at indigenous women, the disparities grow even more pronounced. In some tribal communities, the murder rate for indigenous women is as high as 10 times the national average. Domestic violence is as much as seven times higher for indigenous women. A study by the US Department of Justice in 2010 found that more than four out of five American Indian and Alaska Native women, 84% to be precise, have experienced violence in their lifetime. This includes sexual violence, physical abuse, and psychological aggression. The same study found that 40% of indigenous women had experienced violence just in the previous year. And in the majority of cases, this violence was at the hands of someone outside their tribe. There are too many other statistics like this showing staggering disparities in health, well-being, and longevity, not just by race or ethnic group, but also by gender. Our speaker tonight will help us understand and explore some of the root causes, policies, and history behind them. So before we get started, I have just a final few notes. Um, we are going to email you an evaluation survey uh, after today's presentation. Please keep an eye out for it. Uh, we read every survey response, and these are vital to helping us plan and improve these events in the future. Materials will be posted on our website after tonight's presentation, including complete video coverage of this event. Please note that the video can take a few weeks for us to finalize and post. The video will also be available with Spanish voiceover dialogue. Sorry, I feel like I'm cutting in and out. We do try to get written materials up on the website sooner. And if you're ever interested in any of the talks that have delivered in this series, they are all on our website. And I strongly encourage you to reference them and use them. They're a great series. I also request that you silence your cell phone if you haven't done so already. Thank you. So I want to acknowledge uh, that we have a number of grantees in the 2018 and 19 Health Equity Learning Series cohort. And tonight's event is being recorded, and these organizations will be hosting viewings of this recording in communities across Colorado. The presentation viewings will all be accompanied by professionally facilitated discussions. Additionally, I want to highlight the six grantee organizations whose names are in bold on the screen. 
these grantees comprise the inaugural class of our community leaders in health equity track. In addition to hosting event viewings, staff from these organizations and other community members are taking part in an intensive 18-month curriculum focused on health equity education and awareness. This is really a significant time commitment and I applaud them all for dedicating the effort and energy to be a part of it. If you'd like to find a viewing event near you, please visit our Health Equity Learning Series page on our website. There's an interactive map that, you, that allows you to locate a grantee in Colorado closest to you. These events will begin taking place around the state in another few weeks. So now I'm pleased and honored to introduce you to Tate Walker, our speaker this evening. Tate Walker uses the pronouns they and them. They are a Lakota citizen of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe of South Dakota and describe themselves as a, quote, banner-waving, two-spirit feminist and indigenous rights activist, unquote. They are a published, as you know, an award-winning storyteller for outlets like Native People's Magazine, Everyday Feminism, Feminist Humanist Alliance, Indian Country Today, and many more. Their work is also featured in a newly published anthology called Fierce Essays by and About Dauntless Woman. And I can't encourage you enough to read this book. It is a wonderful, wonderful series. They hold a master's degree from the University of South Dakota, graduated magna cum laude with a bachelor's degree from Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado, and they have 15 years of experience working for daily newspapers, social justice organizations, and tribal education systems to organize students and professionals around issues of critical cultural competency, anti-racism, anti-bias, and inclusive community building. You will learn more about them at the website and Twitter links on the screen. So please, oh, and I want to, one other thing. Their, Tate is willing to sign books at the end of tonight. So if you want your book signed, she will, they will be here to sign them. Please help me in welcoming Tate Walker to the stage. I'm a bit taller than Gwen. Yeah, you Let's go up here. That's my Lakota greeting. It just says, I'm so happy to be here. I greet you with a good heart. And I am from Cheyenne River in central South Dakota. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. Thank you to the Colorado Trust, Transformative, Alliance, alliances and my Anishinaabe relatives for bringing me here today. I'd also like to extend recognition to the Ute, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Apache, and other tribes as the original and ongoing caretakers of these now settler occupied lands of so-called Colorado. We're starting off strong guys. <laughs> I find my way back to the state every few years and take in a little more indigeneity every time. I was born and raised across South Dakota, where my mother's family is from, but lived in Parker, Colorado from 1993 to 1998 and went to an elementary school called, wait for it, Cherokee Trail Elementary. <laughs> yeah, this was at a time in my life where being native was a surface level identifier, kind of like, hey, I'm 10 years old, I love Disney, macaroni and cheese, and I'm Lakota. At Cherokee Trail Elementary, I learned nothing of the actual Cherokee Trail of Tears, but jingle danced to entertain my classmates. Culture was performative. In 1998, my dad moved our family to Bismarck, North Dakota, made famous, of course, now by the No Dakota Access Pipeline movement of 2016. But I did graduate high school uh, from Bismarck, North Dakota in 2001. I was a ward of the state, and within the system, they uh, promoted uh, indigenous colleges or indigenous friendly colleges like Fort Lewis College, which was great. Uh, it, that 
school boasts a student, native student body population of roughly 30%, which is fantastic, and gives free tuition to qualified native students. So thank you, Fort Lewis College. My undergrad was a place for exploring and accepting both my culture and sexuality, and I'm so grateful for my time spent in the San Juan Mountains. Couldn't afford to live there, though. Mm. All right. After living in Nebraska, after graduation, I moved back to South Dakota to be near family and earn my Master of Science. Uh, but we loved Colorado so much that we were looking for employment and found a gig in Colorado Springs. And there we learned to love the mountains and met some family who is in the audience tonight. And we're so grateful for that connection. But I was offered a dream job in Phoenix in 2015 as the editor-in-chief of Native Peoples Magazine. Now defunct, sadly, but that dream job did lead to a lot of great connections. So I actually work as communications director of a tribal school system in the Phoenix Valley area. And it's so amazing to have daily impact with the community I love and cherish so much. Today I'll be talking about an issue that has stalked indigenous women of the Americas since explorers and settlers began colonizing this land, violence against indigenous women. We'll be discussing the many and varied ways native women experience this violence, how that violence is directly tied to sexism, racism, and settler colonialism specifically, and how we might go about educating and preventing this violence now so that we can ensure health equity for future generations. Before we get started, I'd like to remind the audience that this presentation, like most discussions about violence, will be messy. I apologize to our translator. <laughs> because I speak fast and I have about three hours of information I'm trying to chunk into 40 minutes. But I will say that um, working with the Colorado Trust has been amazing and uh, as a gift back, I'm typing up, well, I have these notes now typed up and uh, we'll be making those available so they have all the links to the references that I'm making. Let's see. So violence against indigenous women. That's a phrase that encompasses so much and we could spend years discussing its origins, causes, current manifestations, and other issues surrounding it because it does indeed deserve that time. But as I get about 40 minutes with you, I've set forth some topic parameters to guide us today. We know, of course, that nation borders are arbitrary and that our indigenous brothers and sisters north and south of the so-called United States experience similar violence that I'm going to be talking about today. However, today I'm centering indigenous women primarily from the so-called United States. If you're interested in seeing data that includes men, I have a report that's going to be linked to this presentation that, from the National Institute of Justice that shows, among other interesting things, that violence impacts Native men at nearly the same rate as Native women. So the stats that Gwen gave you before are actually pretty close with what Native men experience as well. We also know that relational violence transcends arbitrary gender-based borders, that male-identifying folks, gender non-conforming folks, and others experience specific violence issues. However, my talk today is specific to feminine and women-identifying or passing folks that includes two spirits who identify and pass within the feminine framework. So, so we're gonna talk about some terms that we need to know that'll set forth uh, the foundation we're, we're using today. So indigenous, native, Native American, or American Indian, tribal, these are Western umbrella terms for and vague references to thousands of unique nations, individuals within Turtle Island who have histories dating back to always and currently experiencing oppression stemming from settler colonialism. You can see also Indian, Native American, First Nations, Aboriginal, Skins, Indian. Please note too that when I use native, which will be throughout this presentation, it specifically refers to people of the United States. It's also a capital N and is short for Native American, which is why I cringe at your green bumper stickers here in Colorado. That, oh, I'm sorry, didn't mean to gag. <laughs> I generally only use Indian or American Indian within direct quotes. However, terms like American Indian and Indian country are still the legal language used in federal law to refer to the indigenous people of the United States. Within our own familial or community circles, many natives still use Indian, even though that's pretty outdated, obviously. But that's a word that belongs to Native people. We've been presented with it, and lots of folks have claimed it or are reclaiming it and continue to use it. That's for Native people only. 
The absolute best way to reference any native or indigenous person is to identify them by their nation, i.e., I am Tate Walker, Mini Konju Lakota, not Tate the Native American who speaks for all natives. I don't. Indigenous people are not monolithic. So women, note the spelling. I really appreciate the definition the Colorado Trust put into its link to um, the invitation here. It's an alternative spelling that rejects patriarchy and language by removing men as the root of women. And that proactively includes transgender women, female assigned gender queer or gender non-conforming folks, as well as cisgender women. So whenever you hear me say women, visualize the X. Sexism. It's prejudice, discrimination based on sex, especially discrimination against women, behavior, conditions, or attitudes that foster stereotypes of social roles based on sex. Please note, though, uh, not part of this, but there is a difference between misogyny and sexism, right? Misogyny is taking it that extra step where there's, there's that uh, like contempt and even uh, actual violence, whether it's physical or emotional violence. Uh, you can be sexist, but not a misogynist, but all misogynists are sexist. Racism, a belief that race, a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. Patriarchy, it's a socio-political and cultural system that values masculinity over femininity and perpetuates oppressive, i.e. cruel and unjust control and limiting gender roles, the gender binary, transphobia, sexism, sexual assault, political and economic subordination of women and more. We don't have big enough slides for that definition. Same with this one. Settler colonialism is an ongoing system of power that perpetrates the genocide and repression of indigenous peoples and cultures. Settler colonialism normalizes the continuous settler occupation, exploiting lands and resources to which indigenous peoples have genealogical relationships. I'm just gonna skip that rest. So what these definitions I just showed you don't include, but it's so important to take in, is this, the, the thinking of power dynamics. You have to remember that when you talk about things like sexism. It's just, it's not a simplified two sentence definition that goes into things like sexism or racism. Especially when you talk about, say, racism. Uh, that's privilege, privilege being system advantages that you have, like say access to trust funds or reliable transportation or running water. Racism is privilege plus prejudice, which are cultural norms that have been established and deemed preferable over non-dominant cultures. Racism is privilege plus prejudice plus power. And with that power, I'm talking about specifically institutional and systemic power, power that's backed by government laws. So racism is race prejudice plus social institutional power. It's a system advantages based on one's race. It's a system of oppression based on race. And that race that we're talking about is white and whiteness. When we talk about white supremacy, that's the power we're talking about. For white and white passing people like myself, it's easy to get defensive when discussing racism. Well, I didn't kill the Indians, Tate. My best friend in college was Indian. I love Indians. I'm pretty sure my great great grandmother was Indian. A lot of white folks and white passing folks, we shut down when black, brown, and indigenous people make requests for white folks to shoulder their fair share of the burden, meaning most, if not all, of the burden when we talk about dismantling the racist systems we live in. That's when we start hearing things like, damn, Tate, she's so angry, she just pushes recording devices off things. Man, and, and I don't know why she's demanding I call my legislators to reject the Bayou Bridge Pipeline. I don't even live in Louisiana. She drives a car. She, that's enough. Geez. Oh, Let's block her on Facebook. I don't know if that's a true story or not. Probably is. I'm kidding. But I'd love for us as white folks, white passing folks, to get to a place where we can start looking at our defensive reactions and recognize those as agents of Oh, I have work to do. I'm not familiar with this issue, and my ignorance has me all up in my feelings, so it's up to me as a quality individual to do better and ensure my squad, my circle, does as well. One of the best ways to begin dismantling racism, sexism, and settler colonialism is to listen to the powerless. 
and then take action to end their oppressions. And we'll talk about what that action looks like at the end of this presentation. So keep in mind that when we talk about the oppressions that indigenous women face, they are intersectional. I love this quote by Audre Lorde. To put it another way, we're oppressed as minorities, as indigenous women, brown folks, all kinds of folks, at multiple crossroads. Therefore, we can be concerned with something like state police violence being experienced right now by our First Nation relatives protecting life in Wet'suwet'en in Canada from extractive industries and care passionately about language revitalization efforts in tribal schools and fight against the use of racist mascots in sports like Washington's professional football team. Never, ever tell someone there are more important things to worry about if you don't understand why something is important, ask yourself what privileges or advantages you have that allow you to avoid that specific, conf that specific conflict in your life, and then take the extra step to learn how you can use that privilege to help others. So when we talk about violence against indigenous women, we need to look first at historical trauma. What is it? Michelle Sotero, an instructor in healthcare administration and policy at the University of Nevada, offers this threefold definition. The dominant culture perpetrates mass trauma on a population, colonialism for instance. That affected population shows physical and psychological symptoms, dying, diseases, addictions. And then those people who are experiencing that colonialism, that violence, pass their responses on to trauma of trauma. Let me apologize. That those folks who are experiencing that violence pass those responses of trauma to the subsequent generations. And then they display those same symptoms. And this is where we see health inequity most clearly. According to researchers, high rates of addiction, suicide, mental illness, sexual violence, and other ills among Native peoples might be, at least in part, influenced by historical trauma. Pull your attention to the quote down there. Many present day health disparities can be traced back through epigenetics to a colonial health deficit, the result of colonization and its aftermath. That's what we're talking about when we say settler colonialism. It still has impacts today. So what does it mean? To be born into a tribal community means experiencing firsthand the multiple ways your people have been oppressed by state sanctioned violence. Take the current government shutdown we indigenous people already suffer from underfunded healthcare clinics and programs, services and funding for those services that were promised to us in what the Constitution refers to as the supreme law of the land, treaties. Made with tribes, oh, sorry, the shutdown means, sorry. <clears throat> so the shutdown that we're experiencing means a lot of those critical services aren't being offered or staff, many of them native, aren't being paid. So for instance, I recently had a mental health appointment at the Phoenix Indian Medical Center, and that's operated by Indian Health Service. I needed to reschedule, and I kept calling and calling, and it wasn't being answered, which is pretty rare. And so I was actually able to drive by the clinic, and there was a line out the door, the mental health clinic. And I walked in and said, I need to reschedule, and then just the staff was so flustered and so just, I mean, it was bare bones in there. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> I'm so lucky that I wasn't experiencing a mental health crisis, but how many of those folks in line were? And that government shutdown has real consequences now. So historical trauma is often passed through anniversaries or celebrations. We remember the horrors of Wounded Knee or Sand Creek. We remember how religious and government boarding schools were established to kill tribal identities of native kids. We're forced every year to re-experience ignorant celebrations of historically suspect people like Andrew Jackson, Abraham Lincoln, and Christopher Columbus, who are responsible for some of the worst genocidal policies and state-sanctioned acts of violence native people ever experienced. And we grow up with these stories about how America has always hated us, and those stories are legitimized through our own daily experiences with violence. So today I'm speaking specifically of the kinds of violence experienced by indigenous women today. By the way, that picture was taken right here in Denver. It was the Senior Rivers Red March on February 14th, I think it was 2014. So Gwen actually gave you a nice overview of some of those statistics. Just as a refresher, 
in the United States, Native women are murdered at 10 times the national average. One in three Native women will be raped in her lifetime. I just want to pull your attention to the table of my friends, where there are four Native women at least, maybe more. You can do the math. Let's see, 39% uh, of Native women experience intimate partner violence, and 80% of the perpetrators of this violence are non-Native. That data comes from quite a bit of uh, sources, Indian Law Resource Center, Centers for Disease Control, Bureau of Justice Statistics, and the Department of Justice itself. What's really important about those stats is that every single one of those organizations collecting that data will tell you it's underreported by estimates of 30%. So go back to those stats, which are already jaw-dropping, and get in another 30% in there. I can tell you as an indigenous woman, having traveled the, have traveled the United States, that there's not one Native woman I've met who hasn't experienced some kind of traumatic violence. Another thing to keep in mind with this data and why it's so underreported is that no one agency coordinates or tracks this data. There are 573 unique federally recognized tribes today. That number fluctuates. Keep in mind that federally recognized is a government partnership, so there are hundreds of non federally recognized tribes as well. Uh, and they all have their own jurisdictions, their own language, their own cultural values. So when we say what's violence experienced here, it's going to be way different from another tribe. And that makes it hard to coordinate the data. Savannah's Act was introduced by Senator Heidi Hudkamp of North Dakota. It was problematic in her own ways, but that's another uh, presentation. Uh, but she introduced Savannah's Act as a response to violence that occurred uh, in Fargo, uh, North Dakota, Savannah LaFontaine Greywind. She was 22 years old and eight months pregnant when her upstairs neighbor cut a infant out of her belly. Um, that was in 2017, and Savannah's Act would have meant coordination among different agencies. So I mentioned the struggles that just tribe to tribes have with data. Well, tribes to federal government, tribes to state government, county, whatever the local government is, there is no connection there. There's no talking with each other. And Savannah's Act would have mandated that. It also would have mandated a single source, a point of access to that data, which really would have made it nice to see what the data looks like and how we can, again, avoid and prevent this violence from happening. So I mentioned before that all Native women and girls, at least that I've exper uh, had experience with, have um, told me about violence in their lives. And I will say that even if they haven't experienced violence, they probably will, or at least they've been impacted in some way. If you're a young child growing up, uh, chances are your mother, if she's indigenous, has experienced some kind of violence and that's being passed down in some way in terms of those symptoms and how um, you, know, you process those, those, that violence. When I lived in South Dakota, I volunteered as a rape crisis uh, counselor and had, um, uh, was blessed to be able to work with, sadly, too many Native women and their families. And one story sticks out to sort of bring this fact home that everyone has experienced it or at least uh, expects to. So I'm talking to this mother and her daughter and the daughter is sexually active, so we're talking about you know, safe sex and consensual sex. What does that look like, and how do we make that practice happen? And the mom laughs bitterly. <laughs> we already talked about this together, me and her. Oh, yeah, I say, well, tell me some of the stuff you've talked about. Well, I just told her it's better if she just lays there and doesn't move and just gets it over with. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> obviously this lady has never had an enjoyable sexual experience in her life. And I was like, tell me more about why you would tell your daughter that. Well, I don't lie to my kids, she says. Man, I just tell it like it is. When she gets raped, just lay there so that she's, it's just over with. I don't know if you caught that, but the mom didn't say if she gets raped, she said when. And that's always stuck with me because that's the experience, that's, that's the daily life of Native women. It's not, it's not a if, it's a when. So how are we supposed to make or have quality health in whatever ways that might manifest? How is that supposed to be possible when we're constantly worried about a violent act that might happen against us? So in her debut book, The Beginning and, of, uh, the Beginning and End of Rape, Confronting Sexual Violence in Native America, great book, by the way, check it out. Sarah Deer, who's Muscogee Creek, she says our approach to 
talking about violence, right? Ending and preventing this violence, it's done all wrong. And in a very simplistic way, the language we use. Researchers who are often non-native and media also often non-native, they'll refer to violence against native women as a quote unquote epidemic. And I'm sure you've probably heard that in the media, the epidemic of violence against women, the epidemic of rape, right? And Deer argues that language like this is part of the problem. Epidemic, that word, refers to something biological and blameless. Two things violence like rape or child abuse or domestic violence are not. Violence against Native women is historical, political, and purposeful. Federal law, for instance, accommodates rape and domestic violence by destroying tribal legal systems. There was a statistic we saw in a previous slide about how roughly 80% of the people who abuse women are themselves not Native. There are reasons for that. Again, we go back to sexism, racism, and you guessed it, settler colonialism. Prior to 2014, tribal governments were effectively banned from prosecuting non-natives on tribal lands. It's a well-known fact in Indian country that predators flock to reservations because they know they can get away with murder, literally. In 2013, Congress reauthorized the Violence Against Women's Act, which affirmed tribes' ability to exercise special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction over non-natives who commit domestic assault or engage in dating violence on tribal lands. For this, women and tribal rights activists in Indian country celebrated. It was a great first step. But it's been six years later and just 20 some tribes have implemented this Violence Against Women's Act statute to prosecute non-natives. So remember, there's 573 tribes, fewer than 25 of them have implemented this statute. There's a lot of reasons for that. Tribal courts have to jump through a ton of hoops just to prosecute the folks that are committing violence on their lands. So the statute is hard to implement first and foremost. And it's built like that. The white legislators, white male legislators specifically, who passed this act, they feared non-natives, read white people, wouldn't get a fair shake in tribal court. Essentially, white people were scared they would be treated the same way they see natives and other people of color treated in US courtrooms with disproportionate number of convictions and stricter sentencing. <gasps> because, uh, because the Violence Against Women's Act expired this past December, and we're all kinds of angry about that. My notes say something else. Um, <laughs> there is one bright spot. As of March 7th, 2015, tribes no longer need federal approval to exercise criminal jurisdiction over non-natives, but tribal governments must comply with that statutory requirement that I was talking about before. So though these Violence Against Women grant programs, like the one my mashke, my friend, works for in Colorado Springs, they're facing funding crises due to Congress's inability to do their work um, and reauthorize this, um, the Violence Against Women's Act, it's important to note that tribal jurisdictions no longer need reauthorization by Congress. So that's one bright spot. One more time. So while there is good news, there's also still a ton of work to be done. According to the National Congress of American Indians, the Violence Against Women's Act itself is so narrowly tailored that tribal police and prosecutors can only respond to the charge if a non-Indian perpetrator for domestic violence, um, uh, for instance, they can't charge a non-Indian with child abuse um, or abuse of elders or senior citizens or even destruction of property. They're also unable to charge a perpetrator or abuser who is violent toward responding officers. Um, Domestic abuse cases are complicated and often involve more than just the abuser and his victim. They involve the family of the victim or even of the abuser, neighbors, cousins. So while granting the special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction, so while tribes can prosecute non-natives, it runs far short of what the actual possibilities of it could do. So one of the three implementing tribes of this statute, this Violence Against Women's Act statute, the Pascoyaki in uh, Arizona, they were one of the first, so they were one of the pilot tribes to implement this statute. And they said cases involving non-natives are now accounting for more than 25% of the domestic violence caseload. And that's a lot of pressure on a tribe that didn't have those services before. 
and they're seeing a 10 to 20% spike in operational costs just to prosecute those. So, wow, yeah. So that's a lot to take in. And when, like I mentioned, when we started the violence against women specifically discussion, we have those baseline stats we talk about, but it's always in the framework of like sexual violence. But so much more violence that Native women experience is not like sexual abuse, it's not domestic violence, it's, it's oh, across the way. So I'm gonna show you, that's what we're gonna talk about in the bulk of uh, this final part of the presentation, is what do those other violence um, <coughs> systems have? How are those in play and how do those impact Native lives? So we talked about historical trauma, but we also have many other uh, uh, forms of violence. Um, things we don't think about. Um, so for instance, we have educational violence. Sadly, I can't get into this too much. I'm only gonna highlight three of those. Um, but educational violence, I encourage you to um, later in the Q&A ask about boarding schools or um, the, um, the presentation that I've typed up has links to the pieces that I've actually written about um, in the past for different publications about boarding schools, I highly recommend you check that out because educational violence is something, even though boarding schools we feel like was way back when, it still has impacts today, um, especially when you consider like just this last Halloween in Albuquerque, a white teacher cut off the braids of a native student and called another native student a bloody Indian. That was 2018 folks, or also in 2018, Colorado State University had its own uh, educational violence against two Native students who came to tour the campus and were um, taken out of that tour group by uh, campus police because a white mother felt uncomfortable. In her words, those students were creepy. In white words, that means they were other and she didn't want them there. So that's educational violence we're continuing to experience today. State police violence, another one I'm gonna kinda skip through but one that I think is super important. I think a lot of folks don't realize when you look at the statistics and data and when you compare populations that Native people experience um, violence by police at higher rates, at the highest rate than any other demographic. It's 38% um, higher. Oh, I apologize, that's a wrong stat. Um, hold on. Um, Okay, well there's a link to there, I apparently didn't have it, but it says Native Americans are more likely to be killed by police than any other racial group. Um, that's the Department of Justice statistics. But um, beyond that, one, um, so when I was a journalist in South Dakota, uh, you know, we talk about state violence, it's not just killing Natives, but incarcerating them. So I was doing a story uh, at a women's prison talking about how um, incarceration impacts uh, the, the Native families, especially when you talk about Native women in prison, they're the caregivers of the family usually, uh, and so how do those kids um, survive without their primary caretaker? And one of the women was saying, well, you know, it hasn't all been bad. You know, the women's prison has provided me with like, cultural things I've never experienced. Um, I, I'm taking language classes here in prison, I'm learning to bead, and I made my first shawl, and Man, I, I, didn't, I didn't get to learn that when I was going to school, educational violence. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's kind of funny because, you know, I have more relatives in here than I did in Rapid City, a white city in South Dakota. And the joke of the women's prison was the prison was the 10th reservation in South Dakota. We have nine federally recognized tribes. And they laugh about it like, oh, that's funny. And I'm sitting there like, what? <laughs> because the numbers back them up. There are, it's a... Uh, Let's see, um, so in the past five years alone, the number of Native Americans incarcerated in federal prisons increased by 27%. Um, it's uh, in South Dakota, the, it's the state with the fourth, high, the fourth highest percentage of uh, Natives in the state. Um, natives in South Dakota only represent about 8.5% um, of the total population in South Dakota, but are 60% of the prison population. That's men and women. 60%. So state violence also includes social services. Again, I'm not going to get too into this, but I highly encourage you to look up um, the Indian Child Welfare Act. It's one of the few statutes we have, one of the few acts we have in federal law that actively upholds tribal sovereignty. 
because it keeps, or it's supposed to keep, native kids in native communities. Uh, back in the uh, 50s and 60s boarding school era, they would remove native kids for things like, oh, they don't have a car. Oh, they, their door didn't uh, close properly. Um, uh, they, they didn't make it to the, um, to the, the court hearing. The parents couldn't make it to the court hearing, and so we're keeping the kids for another 60 days. True stories, by the way. Um, it was constantly under threat, uh, and this includes currently, where uh, you'll have non-native folks adopting native kids or, or having them in foster care and demanding to be able to adopt them. And Indian Child Welfare Act, ICWA, prevents that from happening. And so these white parents will pressure that in court not realizing that that statute's in place to protect the, the identities of these kids. Um, without ICWA, without the Indian Child Welfare Act, I mean, you're talking about essentially the destruction of native families again. If uh, we can, if, if those, it's essentially kill the Indian, save the man all over again. That's what boarding schools were built to do. So check that out. Um, one of the things I definitely want to talk about though is political violence. Oops, sorry, that was a slide I missed. So, sorry, just go back to that. So as a for instance, in South Dakota, which is constantly forgetting <laughs> about its Indian Child Welfare Act responsibilities, uh, native kids, <laughs> they only make up 13.5% of the total youth population, but represent over 50% of kids in the system. As a youth who was a ward of the state in North Dakota, which is very similar to South Dakota, I can tell you that Every single one of the kids that I was in a group home with was native. And like the women in prison I talked to, it was actually a place, because there were so many natives in the system, it was a place where we learned. That was the first place I experienced a sweat lodge. Mm, go figure. So political violence. This is an important one because it's something that happens all the time. So of the 12,000 people elected to Congress since 1789, <laughs> Only 300 of them have been native. Two are identified natives currently, well, pre-2019, January 2019. Um, they were um, serving in the House. That was Tom Cole, who's Chickasaw, and Mark Wayne Mullen, who's Cherokee. They're both from Oklahoma and both Republican with major extractive industry interests. But now, thankfully, we have two native women. Woo! And uh, in the House, that's Deb Holland from um, New Mexico. She's Laguna Pueblo and Sharice Davids, oh, I love her so much. Um, she's Ho-Chunk and she's from Kansas. Go check these ladies out. They're doing some really good stuff already uh, as, the, as, as servants, uh, political servants. Um, so keep in mind when we talk about things like representation, right, which is super important if you're talking about getting issues like the um, Savannah Act or even Violence Against Women's Act approved, um, that we were only granted citizenship as indigenous people in 1924. It's less than 100 years of having access to the political system. Um, and a lot of these states, like South Dakota, even New Mexico, where Deb Holland's from, didn't fully implement citizenship rights, like voting, um, until the 60s. And a lot of them still refuse to give full access um, and participation to natives, like North Dakota. I don't know if you all were keeping track last year in the midterms, but North Dakota actively disenfranchised native voters by request or requiring that natives have a physical address. And if you've ever been in rural areas, you know that you give directions by signposts and like, oh, the, the, that down tire over there, that's where she lives. And you know that broke down window? Go three houses past that. The dog will start barking and that's where she lives. That's how you tell where people live. Otherwise you have PO boxes. And the um, Secretary of State wasn't gonna allow PO boxes as a effective form of um, uh, verifying an address of a voter. And so um, that kind of backfired though. Um, on on the Standing Rock, uh, voter participation increased 106% um, from uh, the previous midterm elections, which is pretty cool. But that still meant that leading up to the election, those native folks were working tenfold to make sure that native people could have access to the polls. So again, political violence is what we're talking about. So this lack of rep representation at the highest levels of government leads to more and more barriers to resources as well as an extreme lack of knowledge regarding indigenous identity and issues. This comes into play with 
some liberal favorites, such as Elizabeth Warren. She's the Massachusetts legislator who has made headlines the last few years for her claims of Cherokee, of Cherokee ancestry, which have been debunked by the Cherokee Nation she claims to be part of. Despite what media would claim, actual Native people are very concerned with how Warren, Warren's obvious political stunt in taking a DNA test and publicly announcing those results, regardless of her intentions, right, it's damaging to Native people and our communities. Indigenous scholars, researchers, and scientists, including, and take notes on this, Dr. Kim Talbear, she's sister Tenwapitin Oyate, Rebecca Nagel, who's Cherokee, and Dr. Adrian Keene, who's also Cherokee, they've written and spoken extensively for years about Warren's false tribal claims and the very real harm that she has done to Native people who experience the debates about that ancestry as literal harm. So the racist Trump, uh, racist <laughs> tweets and talks that Trump gets. <laughs> People do racist things. <laughs> um, so again, anyway, so um, yeah, it's harmful. Um, but so Trump referring to Warren as Pocahontas, who is widely considered by the people of her own tribe as a child sexual assault victim, and Florida Congressman Matt Gates referring to Sakakawi or you know, Sacagawea, however you say. Um, so those remarks are used in derogatory ways, right? Pocahontas herself isn't someone that's derogatory to talk about. Uh, or Sacagawea, right? Them themselves aren't derogatory. Uh, but how they're using them is. And it takes away from the issues uh, that are real and experienced now. So when we can say things in tweets like, oh, Pocahontas has, she's on the war path, ha, 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 right? You're not, you don't care about Native people, right? You, you, your, your, your Republicans didn't pass the Van Act, right? That could have helped child sexual assault victims. Irony there. So I just got the five minute thing, so I'm gonna go skip through. But um, so political violence, uh, though, is experienced in many and varied ways. Um, violence Against Women's Act not being reauthorized, that's political violence. The government shutdown, as we've talked about, extreme political violence. Um, and even the deaths of migrant women and children who, uh, you know, the, the Jacqueline, um, she was, um, um, indigenous in, Gu in Guatemala, um, Claudia, um, shot and killed in May by Border Patrol agents. I mean, these are our sisters to the south and their experience political violence at the worst levels possible. Oh, I have so much to tell you. Okay, um, okay, so we talk about health inequity, right? Um, so just take this example, living in Phoenix, this has been all over the news about a woman who's been comatose for 10 years or more. Um, she recently gave birth in a healthcare facility. No, none of her caretakers knew she was pregnant until she started moaning and a baby popped out. Um, she's San Carlos Apache. Um, and this is an extreme example, but we experience this kind of, um, I mean, that's settler colonialism to the extreme, right? Our bodies aren't even our own when we're trying to heal ourselves. And the healthcare shutdown, or the government shutdown, of course, is, uh, is impacting our healthcare clinics. I mentioned my own experience with mental health. Um, um, oh, in my, tr in my state of South Dakota, in my own tribe, uh, women can't give, they can't schedule birth uh, on my tribe. So there's no facility set up to accommodate, say, just live birth. So you have to schedule your, your um, OBGYN appointments uh, like in Pierre or Bismarck or some other place that's hours away, um, unless it's an emergency uh, delivery, you're going out of your own home community to give birth. Um, that's, that's health violence. Um, so much stuff. <laughs> Environmental violence. This is um, something we see too often. Um, one thing to keep note of here is that almost across the board when I talk to indigenous women, especially those on the front lines of environmental violence, environmental issues and movements, they say that violence against the land is violence against them as indigenous women. And I, you can't separate those. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that. Um, yeah, just watch, guys. Um, so environmental violence, government shutdown, once again. Uh, a lot of the national parks 
um, have uh, those still house the places where we gather and collect medicines um, and do sacred ceremonies. Uh, those places are being trampled upon by American tourists who can't be trusted to treat those parks with respect <laughs> without uh, national park um, um, rangers, right? Uh, they're saying, no, you can't put that trash there. You can't have graffiti on those rocks. Um, that's definitely violence against our sacred spaces. Um, white vegans <laughs> and their abuse against indigenous hunting and meat consumption. Um, a lot of folks who, uh, like for instance, coastal, coastal um, indigenous folks will often be um, uh, protested against for like seal hunts. Um, even though one seal could feed dozens of families, uh, you still get the, no, oh, that's fine, you know, save the seals. I agree, mass consumption of seals is not okay. But when you talk about indigenous folks and the sacred um, rights that go into hunting those animals, um, that's important to keep alive. Um, and again, the relationships that those indigenous people have with those animals are completely different and not at all within the framework of like Western assumptions of what animals are. Um, our food systems in, in particular, right? Um, how we harvest and collect our foods will often impact indigenous women more greatly than others because we're primarily living in rural areas. And so contaminants from um, extractive industries will hit us first. On the Navajo Nation, for instance, there are artists who collect dirt um, uh, and special clay for their, like say, pottery. And they're noticing the toxins coming from nuclear waste sites are getting into their pottery, <laughs> right? So um, keep those in mind. Uh, that. Uh, Environmental violence is impacting us on many levels. We're almost done. Media is full of violence. I'm not going to talk too much about that now, but in my in the fierce book you all have, uh, my essay talks at length about representational issues within media. That's sort of where I um, started out as an activist, is talking about uh, mascots, uh, indigenous mascots. In fact, um, my kiddo and I, back in 2012, 13, 14, anyway, back when the um, uh, legislat legislature here in Colorado were talking about creating a commission to look at native mascots at public schools here, uh, we testified in support of that commission. So um, my kiddo was roughly six years old at the time, five or six years old, uh, and got up there and, and read their speech. And uh, uh, I won't say she swayed it, but that commission was approved, and I know has done some great work. Um, mascots uh, are one of the, especially sports mascots, are one of the uh, ways in which um, it's easy to access non-native people um, because sports is so ingrained in all aspect, in all all American lives. Really, even if you don't like sports, you know about them. And so, when we can say things like Indian mascots are racist, and that racism impacts our native youth, we have empirical data that's been researched for decades. Right? No one believes you if you just say it's racist. They're like, prove it. So we have data that proves it, uh, that shows that native kids in particular um, experience uh, ex exceedingly lower self-esteem rates than uh, youth who aren't exposed to that kind of racism, daily racism. Um, Hypersexualization of native women, um, even in like our retail stores, spunky squaw was a big thing last year. Um, and of course, stereotypes. But all that is erasure, and that erasure leads to not knowing about things like murdered and missing indigenous women, or violence against women, or even the Violence Against Women's Act. So I'm going over my time completely here, but I want to skip that and at least end with this. So where do we go from here? The awareness, the, the, what we're doing today is, is the start of things, right? And it's important that you take what you've learned here and go further. Um, you knowing about some of these issues means you can do something. And for a lot of folks, that means having your legislators on speed dial. <laughs> it means voting ways that will uh, positively impact indigenous folks. Um, if you work in nonprofits, it means being uh, having more cultural competency uh, so that you can work, with, work better with your indigenous clients. Demand tribal court systems receive proper support so they can fully implement those uh, violence against women statutes we were talking about earlier. Let's see. Um, demand more representation at educational facilities and nonprofit leaderships, um, all levels of leadership, really. Make sure there's always an indigenous voice on board. Um, 
Uh, oh, demand representation in media. There's a lot of great movements happening right now that uh, are asking publishers who um, say white authors who include indigenous issues, not issues, but like indigenous people in their books, and they're very stereotypically portrayed. Uh, big movement to get those publishers to either pull the book or at least rework it before it's uh, available to mass consumption. Um, American Indians and Children's Literature. Write that down. Really great blog. Debbie Reese's Nambi Pueblo does amazing work on that level. But the number one thing you can do, and I'll stop after this, is believe survivors of all these kinds of violence. If someone tells you they're experiencing some kind of harm, believe them. <laughs> it's so easy, but we make it so hard. We say, prove it. Uh, where's the data behind that? And, well, you know, I have a friend, or oh, I'm native myself, right? Believe survivors, and that will help us pave the way to better futures. Thank you. Thank you.